villages burnt to the ground. Hundreds of thousands displaced. Mass murder. There is compelling evidence of genocide and genocidal intent. The Gambia has taken Myanmar to the International Court of Justice, accusing its government of orchestrating a campaign of destruction against the Rohingya people. There will be no tolerance of human rights violations in the Rakhine. But now we have evidence showing that for many Rohingya, the nightmare continues. As the world awaits a verdict, one on East has been given access to years of secret videos. And we travel to Myanmar's Rakhine state to meet a people still facing danger, discrimination and death. The Gambia's case is centered around a brutal military crackdown which began in late 2016 in response to attacks by an armed Rohingya group. It led to a mass exodus of Rohingya into neighboring Bangladesh in the months that followed. This video is one of many filmed by local activists determined to expose the Rohingya's plight to the world. They are a rare glimpse inside Rakhine State, where journalist access is severely restricted. <laughs> One One East has reviewed and verified more than three years' worth of footage. It tells a horrific story. At a secret location outside Myanmar, we meet a former member of the activist group. For his safety, we're hiding his identity. He filmed this interview just before the mass exodus in 2017 that saw hundreds of thousands of Rohingya fleeing to Bangladesh. <laughs> Nearly three years on, we managed to track down the woman in the video. She now lives in Bangladesh, inside the world's largest refugee camp. The scars on Karima Katun's arm are a constant reminder of what happened to her in Myanmar. She says hundreds of soldiers attacked her home in Chutpin village on the 27th of August 2017 when she and her baby were shot. <laughs> Karima's husband was also killed in the attack, along with three other members of their family and hundreds of her fellow villagers. Karima's husband was also killed in the attack, along with three other members of their family 
বাদলে তো গরত গলি গলি ওরে বিড়াইন ধর লাতি মারি মারি নেলা ফলাই ওরে বিড়াইন ধর মুন্ত মুন্ত বেড়াইন ধর গলি 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 ওরে মারি ফলাই গুরা গুরা হয় না কল মানে তলত সুরি বাদি ও তো মানে হেঙ্গুর দুলা নেলা ফলাই মাই হয় ধর স্কুল গলাই ওরে রেপ গজে At the International Court of Justice in The Hague, Aung San Suu Kyi says Chutpin was one of a dozen main conflict areas in 2017. It is of the utmost importance that the court assess the situation obtaining on the ground in Rakhine dispassionately and accurately. Regrettably, the Gambia has placed before the court... She insists the military was merely responding to an armed Rohingya group that had targeted more than 30 police stations and an army base. In northern Rakhine. But she also says this. It cannot be ruled out that disproportionate force was used by members of the defence services, in some cases in disregard of international humanitarian law. If war crimes have been committed by members of Myanmar's defense services, they will be prosecuted through our military justice system in accordance with Myanmar's constitution. The case against Myanmar has galvanized Aung San Suu Kyi's supporters back home. One day before her testimony at the International Court of Justice, thousands gathered in Myanmar's largest city, Yangon, in support of their leader. For many here, the Gambia's case is an assault on the dignity and sovereignty of their country. They insist the Rohingya are foreigners. But Rohingya refugees now sheltering in Bangladesh insist Myanmar is their homeland. Satara Begum doesn't know if she can ever return. She lost her husband during a military operation in August 2017. They lived in Myo Tuji, one of the 12 areas on Su Chi's list. As they were fleeing, her husband decided to go back to lock their door. Satara is now struggling to look after her five children. The youngest is just a toddler. Mohammed Ayas and his family also fled the same area for Bangladesh in 2017. He's kept a record of what happened there. Videos filmed by residents show the extent of the destruction. Aya says the attack was unprovoked.
माणूस जातो पोहण्यास कशी पोहण्याचा लिहा बार विचार दोनते कशुरी जास इधर जरगरा दिये आर कशुरी जास गुली मारजे आर कशुरी जास लोहियारे जास बसक मानूस इधर जास मानी गोत नि फारे नीला जास गरे खानमा गला इधर गरत गलाय बाजू टाणा जाए दिल्ले जास Myanmar's government says it's willing to take back refugees like Ayas. But it wants them to register for a national verification card or NVC, a process that will supposedly pave the way to citizenship. But many Rohingya are reluctant. The process assumes that they are foreigners, leading to fears that even if they are granted citizenship, they won't have the same rights as regular citizens. Ayas insists the Rohingya should be treated equally. Our citizenship right, our jin confiscated to us, our jagah zubin, so shambhati, our education right, in our jin right demand gori, ahan our community equal jin demand gori. We're visiting Rakhine State on a rare government-supervised press tour. From Yangon, it's a half-day journey by air, land and sea. It's five days since the ICJ handed down a preliminary ruling. ordering the Myanmar government to take all measures to protect the Rohingya from genocide. We'll be spending the night in Mongdor, near the border with Bangladesh. Security is tight on the drive up. There are armed police everywhere. On our way, we pass Mil Tuji. There's nothing to suggest this used to be home to a large Rohingya community. A fence and new buildings have been erected. The land is now occupied by a police outpost. Our first stop is a meeting with Mongdor District Administrator U So Ong. We ask him for his reaction to the ICJ's preliminary ruling. <laughs> ลูกแกมาอ่ะตรงนี้เนี่ยดิโอ้ดีดาอัจฉริยะนี่ไม่ปล่อยไม่ปล่อยเสียดูสิเนาะเปลี่ยวถ่าละชื่อเลยอ่
but most Rohingya can't receive more than a high school education. Musa is 19 years old. Musa's father, Syed Ahmad, says it's because he doesn't have the right identity documents. But then, minders from the Ministry of Information take down Musa's details, and he declines to answer any more questions. One afternoon, we managed to walk into downtown Mongdor without our minders. We, we can talk to him. Okay. Outside a mosque, a man agrees to talk to us. But we're interrupted before we can even begin by the administrator of this area, U Tla Thain. We finally find a way to speak without our minders listening in. Rohingya villagers who have kept their distance during our visit have agreed to be interviewed by phone. For security reasons, they've asked us to hide their identities. In more than three hours of conversations, we learned that life for most Rohingya is relentlessly stressful. They must observe curfews, can't travel freely, and have limited access to health care and education. And since early 2019, they've also had to cope with a new crisis. The Rohingya have been caught in the crossfire between the Myanmar military and a Rakhine armed group called the Arakan Army. In this clip, filmed by an activist in April 2019, an injured boy lies on the ground as frantic villagers try to flee. <laughs> Military helicopters can be heard flying overhead. <laughs> the boy was eventually taken to hospital. He survived. <laughs> But for others, the attack proved deadly. A bag of body parts is all that remains of two Rohingya men killed during the same airstrike. They'd gone to the forest to cut bamboo. Nowhere, it seems, is safe. In this video, shot just days before our trip to Rakhine State, a woman mourns the death of her daughter. 
जी तारा जुदेवी आखिन मोरायम तारे सरोद गरबानी दी आजुराई ना भाई लोमले जीरे जीरे जन डार्क जॉब लेकिन क्या आज बोले तू बोले तू नहीं की दी the victim had been hit by shrapnel from a rocket that crashed through her roof. The conflict has also affected locals who are not Rohingya. In this Rakhine village, 68-year-old Yi Thane Nu shows us where she hides whenever fighting breaks out. She says there are several bunkers like this in the area. Other villagers are just as frightened. It's nearly the end of our tour, but there are two more Rohingya villages to visit. Both were partially destroyed in 2017. The Myanmar government says they will resettle villagers who didn't flee. In Padin, remnants of a mosque are a reminder of what happened here. Once home to more than 5,000 people, only 300 remain today. Village administrator Mohammed Hassan is unusually candid. He says it will take more than new houses to make things right. <laughs> In Nyongchong, villagers have been told to wait for us in a school hall watched over by minders and armed police. Inside, the atmosphere is tense and few are willing to speak to us. Mohamed Reyes is 22 years old. It's not part of the government's itinerary, but we managed to find the houses that were burnt down. A villager approaches us. We have our village, one and three holes burned. Who is it do this? A Burmese military. Another villager tells us it's not safe for the Rohingya to return. It appears we've been spotted. Here in Rakhine State, the Rohingya can only speak in whispers or in private about the violence and discrimination they've had to endure. And journalists are closely watched over by government minders. We end the tour acutely aware there's a lot we haven't seen. The International Court of Justice isn't expected to release its verdict anytime soon. 
but whatever the outcome, it's clear human rights violations against the Rohingya aren't confined to the events in 2016 and 17. They've been happening for a long time, and they're still happening right now.